Uh, I, I remember the first time I went to a, um, a house that was one of those homes that you see on the shows where uh, it's overlooking the ocean, big glass wall in the back of the house. It, they have this infinity pool overlooking the beach right there, seeing water as far as you could see. And I remember standing in their kitchen, and I don't know why, but I had this thought. I thought, how long would you live here before that becomes normal? You know what I mean? Like, how long would you live here before you forget at the beauty of what you're staring at? How long would you live here before it just becomes normal? Just, you, you get used to it. You just forget, this is really awesome, and I forgot. I'm just in here chopping carrots in the kitchen, and I forget about this gorgeous view. I say all that, to, thank you. The child just goes, no! <laughs> yeah, thank you. I just say all that to say, um, I hope you know, and I hope you never forget how remarkable your church is. This is such a great church. And I get a chance to go see a lot of different churches. This is just my second time here. And I, and I know we've got people coming from a lot of different campuses and people watching online. Everybody that's at the Ramsey Center, I want to say hello to you. So grateful to get to be with you as well. But I, um, I get to see a lot of churches that are just mailing it in. You know, they're just kind of phoning it in. And you all just have such a remarkable group of people, but there's also such a remarkable spirit here. And if this is not your church, and maybe you're just here today and you're a visitor, you're a guest, maybe somebody invited you, I just want you to know I'm not the normal preacher. And so if you don't even like today, I won't be back next week. So come back next week, no matter what. But I want everybody to be thinking through who you could invite this Christmas season. They've done all this research on how well people respond to a Christmas invite. Most people, your friends that you work with, the, the people that live in your neighborhood or your apartment complex, they would be so open to attending a service with you over the next couple of weeks. And who knows what God might want to do. And the beauty is, is you're inviting them to be a part of a remarkable church. And so I hope that you'll be thinking about it over the next few minutes as we talk about this this idea, this series that we're launching, I love this idea of the series, love came down, love came down. And it's so easy for us to just grow accustomed to Christmas. It's so easy for us to just go, oh yeah, here it is. It's Christmas again, right? Uh, Pastor Abe talked about it last week. In fact, he also mentioned that this is puffy vest season. As soon as he said it, I was like, bro, I'm all in. Let's go. I'll rock mine. He's, he was going unzip. I go zip because I'm 43 years old with a dad bod. And so it's, you know, it's just part of the, uh, it's part of the, part of the uniform. Now, I see a couple of you out there with the puffy vest as well. That's awesome. Um, I, I love this sermon, though. What I loved about it is I love, he, he talked about the drama and the trauma that we all have, that we're all experiencing. And I really appreciate his awareness, and I've heard it from so many different people on stages at RPC, the awareness that Christmas is not all awesome. It is the most wonderful time of the year. Thank you for the laugh. But there's some challenges, right? Some of you are like, yeah, I'm sitting with them right now, right? I mean, Christmas can be challenging. I feel like Thanksgiving is like just an hors d'oeuvre for Christmas, you know? And some of you are like, "Woo! if there is more to come, then I don't know that I can handle it because that one about knocked me out. I mean, this is some, it, honestly, it's, it is a wonderful time of the year, but it's also a reminder of the, some of the dangerous expectations that people do put on, a, on us, some of the challenging family dynamics that some people have, but also it reminds us that it's so easy to lose the mystery and the wonder of Christmas. And I know this is a big, um, this is a big audacious hope that I have for, for this message today as we're kicking off this series is my prayer, my hope is that God would reinstill in you the wonder of Christmas. Because what I know is, is that the more we age, the more at risk we are to miss the wonder of Christmas. The older we get, the easier it is for us to lose the wonder, the mystery that the almighty God came to earth to be near to be here and to save us, to be our rescuer. So easy for that to grow old on us. It's so easy for us to lose the joy of that. Uh, here's a picture of me when I was a little kid. This was Christmas for me when I was about seven years old. Uh, any G.I. Joe people out there? Uh, any peanut butter in your stocking people out there? <laughs> I forgot about this until I saw the picture, but um, I, 
I used to be a big peanut butter fan. I say used to be. I'm still a massive peanut butter fan. But uh, my mom would stick a jar of peanut butter in my stocking, which, you know, when I saw that picture, I was like, gosh, simple days, right? Our kids are like, could you throw an iPhone in my stocking? I'm like, how about a jar of peanut butter? They're like, I have an allergy. Okay, well, we, we do have a peanut allergy in our family, so I wouldn't do that out of love and caution, but... I, I, Christmas, as, when I was a kid, I just remember the, the season, I've tried to remind myself just in preparation for this message, just the, the beauty and the joy of being a kid at Christmas. I mean, I remember that feeling so distinctly of sitting at the top of the stairs, my family, we, that I grew up in a wonderful family. We, we didn't have a ton of money. But I remember we'd, we always had this tradition. It was me and my two sisters. We'd sit up there in our pajamas and our parents would have the music going and they'd have a couple presents and you just would feel this like overwhelming sense of wonder of it is that time of year. And then then you'd get down there and maybe, I don't know what you opened up for Christmas. Maybe it was like a bike, you know? Maybe it was an American Girl doll. Maybe it was an Atari, if you're old school like that. But I remember I was thinking about my, the, the present that knocked me on the ground. The present that that, that uh, caused me to lose my mind the most was this right here. <laughs> oh, lovely touch. Thank you. Anybody remember this? First of all, let me just tell you, for some of you, like, some of you are like, I don't even know who that is or what that is. That's called a cassette tape, Okay. And that's the way the homies used to listen to music back in the day, (laughs) right? I was so floored when I got, I'm not kidding. I remember dancing around the living room, holding it up, being like, I can't believe it. I got it. Some of you were like, why was your mind blown? Because I grew up in a very Christian family, okay? (laughs) I'm grateful for it. But we missed a lot of movies. We missed a lot of music. And when my parents dropped the hammer tape on me, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I never thought y'all would. I thought this was across the line. I mean, it's not Guns N' Roses, use your illusion, but it's close, you know? It's like, it's closer to that than it is Petra. And so I was like, I, I couldn't believe that they would love me this much to give me. Please, hammer, don't hurt them. Oh. As I've been thinking about it, I've been thinking about that feeling. I don't have that feeling anymore. I've lost it. Now I'm the one. My wife and I, we were talking about this. We were like, we're the ones who are hiding the presents now. We're the ones buying the presents now. We got five kids, 14 down to six. I sent our six-year-old into our closet. My fault, because that's Santa's workshop. (laughs) And I was like, hey. He wanted to go throw the baseball in the yard, which I was like, okay, cool. I was like, go grab me some shoes out of my closet. He yells out from my closet, dad, yeah, what's up? Who's this remote controlled dinosaur for? I was like, it's for your mom. She's really into that right now. Shut up and get my shoes. Oh my goodness. I'm like, what has happened to this world, y'all? Like, where has it gone? And I want it back. And I'm not saying I want the wonder of the lights and the wonder of Santa and the wonder of the reindeers. No, I want the wonder of the mystery. The Apostle Paul said, it's the mystery that's been revealed for ages has now been given to us. The love came down. And so I know it's bold, I know it's scary, I know it's audacious to say, I'm hoping over the next few minutes that God might reinstill the wonder in us. I don't believe I have the ability to do that, but I believe God's spirit is powerful enough and his spirit is on the move and his spirit is able and he loves you enough to be able to let you experience it like it's the first time. So if you're titling messages, I'm not really into title. I don't title a lot of messages, but I thought this one, I got to put a title on it, all right? Somebody try to pour my soul out 
And here's the title of this message, what I would call it. How to get lost in wonder when you've lost your wonder. How do you get lost in it? I want to get lost in it. I want to be wide-eyed, mystified, eyes as big as Frisbees, can't believe that God, you would do it for us. Instead of losing my wonder, I want to be lost in the wonder of it all. So we're going to read a couple verses today, but we're going to read some uh, alternative translations, okay? Because sometimes, see, one of the reasons why we lose our wonder, right? I mean, one, because of Google. You know what I'm saying? Like there was a day when you would just wonder about things. Your friends would be talking. You'd be like, I mean, where's Tom Petty from? And you'd be like, I don't know. What if he was from California or Texas or where could he be? And then, you know, some, I've got this one friend that's famous for saying, we don't have to not know. And then they'll whip out their phone and Google it, look it up. And you're just like, no, you're ruining the moment, man. Let's just wonder about it, right? Google's, they're aiding in the loss of our wonder, but also the fact that we've just done it a few times, right? It's gotten, it's gotten rote. We, 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 we've been there before. This isn't your first Christmas. Some of you are like, I know how this ends. I remember I had this really funny Jewish kid growing up in our class, and we were talking about the lion, witch, and the wardrobe. And the Aslan character shows up on the scene, and then the Aslan character, who was the Jesus figure in the lion, witch, and the wardrobe, he dies. And this kid announces to our class, he goes, if I know where this is going, he'll be back in three days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was like, I'm on to it. I get it. I know where this is headed. Some of you feel that way. You're like, what's new? I get it. Jesus was born in a manger. Okay, what else? You know, Subway's got buy one, get one free footlongs. Like what else is going on, right? It just becomes another thing for you. It just becomes normal. So I'm gonna try to, jo I'm gonna try to jostle us out of that. I wanna try to verbally grab us by the shoulders and go, do you understand what has happened? I want to read to you this version of John chapter 1, just a couple of verses, but not the, a translation like English Standard Version or the New International Version that might be closest to the Greek version that it was written in. No, I want to read it to you in a, a version called the Message Version that Dr. Eugene Peterson, who passed away a couple of years ago, theologian, pastor, author, he, he, ga he gives us this translation. If, you're, if, you're, if you feel bored in your faith, I would say grab a version of the message and read the Christmas story this year in the message. Because in John 1, I want, you to, I want you to listen to how he puts the miracle of God becoming flesh, of God coming to earth, of love coming down. Here's what he says. He said, God became flesh and blood. Read this next part. And he moved into the neighborhood. Come on, somebody. Is that not so beautiful? I don't know. Every time I read that, I feel emotional about that. that. I don't know what your problems are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's happening in your life. It might be great. It might be hard. There might be a lot of joy. There might be a lot of suffering. Chances are there's a lot of both. There might be a lot of apathy and boredom. It might feel like your life is mundane. Please, somebody. Do you realize that the almighty God has moved into the neighborhood? He's here. He's with us in the middle of our joy, in the middle of our sorrow, in the middle of the good times, in the middle of the hard times. Emmanuel, God with us. He is here. Look, look at what he says. He says, God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. We got to see it. We were witnesses of this. The one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, and true from start to finish. This is who he is. He's just as the father is. He's a reflection. He's the image of the father. And the father saw it fit to cram his divinity into a human body and allow that human body to walk planet earth to become one of us so that we could always know that you get us, that you understand us, that you know what we're walking through. So what I want to do is I, I want to just read the Christmas story, okay, which is not 
you know, that's not new. You've heard the Christmas story before. This is out of Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2. But I'm going to do it out of this version. That This is a version that we read our kids just about every year. Uh, it's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. All right? So this is, uh, this is a translation of the Bible written by Sally Lloyd-Jones. Um, any, anybody read the Jesus Storybook Bible out there? Anybody? There's like a couple of you. Oh, a couple kids. That's awesome. You get it. Yeah, thank you. We're trying to learn from y'all today, okay? So what, what I want to do is I'm just going to read this. It's going to take like five minutes, okay? But would you please, maybe even just pray, say, Heavenly Father, would you let me hear this like it's the first time? Would you let me fall in love all over again with the, the beauty, the miracle, the mystified wonder that you came to earth? That maybe hearing it would allow us to experience that childlike faith like maybe we once had. Here's the way it goes. This is from Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2. Everything was ready. The moment God had been waiting for was, was here at last. God was coming to help his people just as he had promised in the beginning. But, but how, how would he come? What, what would he be like? What would he do? The mountains would have bowed down. The seas would have roared. The trees would have clapped their hands. But the earth just held its breath. And as silent as snow falling, he came in. And when no one was looking in our darkness, in the darkness, he came. There was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, Joseph was the great, 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 great grandson of King David. And one morning, this girl was just minding her own business when suddenly a great warrior of light appeared right there in her bedroom. He was Gabriel. He was an angel, a special messenger from heaven. And when she saw the tall, shining man standing there, Mary, of course, was frightened. You don't need to be scared, Gabriel said. God, God is very happy with you. Mary looked around to see if perhaps he was talking to someone else. Mary, Gabriel said, and he laughed with such gladness that Mary's eyes filled with sudden tears. Mary, you're going to have a baby, a little boy, and you will call him Jesus. He is God's own son. He is the one. He's the rescuer. The God who flung planets into space and kept them whirling around and around. The God who made the universe with just one word. The one who could do anything at all was making himself small and coming down as a baby. Wait, God was sending a baby to rescue the world? But, but it's, it's just too wonderful, Mary said. And she felt her heart beating hard. How can this be true? Is anything too wonderful for our God, Gabriel asked. And so Mary trusted God more than what her eyes could see, and she believed. I am God's servant, she said. Whatever God says, I will do. And sure enough, it was just as the angel had said, nine months later, Mary was almost ready to have her baby. Now, Mary and Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem, the town King David was from. And when they reached the little town, they found every room was full, every bed was taken. Go away, the innkeepers told them. There isn't any place for you. Where, where would they stay? I mean, soon Mary's baby would come. And they couldn't find anywhere except an old tumble-down stable. And so they stayed where the cows and the donkeys and the horses stayed. And right there in the stable amongst the chickens and the donkeys and the cows and the quiet of the night, God gave the world his wonderful gift. The baby that would change the world was born, his baby son, 
And Mary and Joseph wrapped him up to keep him warm, and they made a soft bed of straw and used the animal's feeding trough as his cradle. And they gazed in wonder at God's great gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mary and Joseph named him Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us because, of course, he had. I, I don't know a situation in the world. I don't know a situation in life that wouldn't be drastically enhanced knowing that God is right there in the middle of the story. If you're in the middle of a hard story, if you're in the middle of a hard season, if you have questions, if there's uncertainty, if there's a, a, a lack of just feeling sure, just an uneasiness, I know firsthand how powerful it is to know that the almighty God is right here now. He's right there in the middle of your story. It's the beauty of love came down is that he's here now. Emmanuel, God with us. How? Well, we'll talk about that the next couple of weeks. What does that mean? We'll talk about that for the next couple of weeks. What do we do with it? We'll get there. But for today, I just wanted to start with this simple idea that the almighty God stepped onto the scene. That he's here. That he's with us now. Whatever you're in the middle of, whatever you're walking through, that that mystery, the mystery that God has come, the mystery of Emmanuel, God with us, the mystery that he's moved into the neighborhood, that that mystery would inspire us to wonder. There, there's just something powerful about getting lost in that wonder. In fact, I want to try to make it as applicable or practical as possible. I'm, I'm going to give you just... Three simple things that I think wonder does. Three, as I look at my own life, three ideas that wonder does for me. The first one is this, is that wonder opens our heart to faith. Open, it, it opens us. That this idea that we could get lost in wonder, how could it be? Can you imagine that he did it? Being in awe of the story can lead us to deepen our faith, right? You, you know that term, having childlike faith. There's something about kids. There's something about the wonder of kids that Jesus himself said, I want that for you. I want you to experience it the way they've experienced it. I want you to understand it the way they're understanding it. But don't you want us to go deeper? Yeah, yeah, I do. But I don't ever want you to lose that childlike faith. Have you ever seen somebody go through something really, really hard? And maybe this is you right now. Maybe this is somebody that you know. Maybe it's somebody that you know through church. Or maybe somebody that you know through your family or through your past. Have you ever seen somebody go through something so hard but they seemed unshakable in the middle of it. You've seen it. You know the power of being rooted in a faith, not a faith that is there for us on the good days. That's wonderful. It's great to have a faith that, is, that informs us when we get the raise, when we get the promotion, when we buy the new house, when we get engaged, when we get married. Those wonderful days of celebration. Having a faith on those days, yes, it is important. But having a faith that can hold us during the hard days. Having a faith that, that can hold us even when we feel like we can't hold on. That's the kind of faith that I know I want. That's the kind of faith I know you want. That's the kind of faith I believe God wants for us. And that kind of faith is born and it's grown and it's deepened and it manifests itself 
through wonder. Through this eyes wide, I can't believe that he would do it. And it takes some wonder because it is a mystery. There was a virgin birth. The almighty God coming to earth. You tried to explain it to somebody and they're like, "Uh, I sound crazy right now, right? And it is. It sounds crazy because it's a miracle. Because it's not of man. Because it's not of human flesh. It is of God. Which is why that angel Gabriel said, is anything too wonderful for our God? This is not your idea. It's not my idea. This is the Almighty's plan. And it takes some wonder to be able to deepen our faith, even in the miracles. Yeah, what wonder, it opens us up to a deeper faith. And then secondly, wonder fuels our joy and our gratitude. Wonder fuels our joy and our gratitude. You you, you know that our world, the society that we're living in, is one of the most anxious societies that has ever walked planet Earth, right? And not just planet Earth, but particularly America. Did you know that studies have shown that when people move to America, their baseline anxiety rises just by living here? Did you know that... High school students today have the same level of anxiety as a psychiatric patient at a hospital in the 1950s would have. I I, I get it. There is a lot of fear. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of expectation. And there's a lot of anxiety. And I'm not one that would just say, well, just have more faith and it'll fix it all. No, I believe in the power of medicine. I believe in the power of therapy. I believe in the power of getting counseling. I believe all of that is really helpful. But I also believe that gratitude and joy are massively helpful to snap us back to the reality of right now of knowing what do I have right now? Can I be okay with where I am right now? That's what gratitude does. Fear, anxiety, stress, uncertainty. It's all about the future. It's all about the what ifs and the what might and oh no, could it be? And it is, there are times where we got to snap out of that into the reality of I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's out there, but I know what I have right now and I know who has me right now. This is Psalm 8. You you remember Psalm 8? Let me read this to you. David's writing this. I want you to picture the psalmist like staring at the stars, like a beautiful celestial galaxy of stars. You know, we have so much light pollution these days, and so we, we wouldn't see it the way he would see it, but I can picture him staring at the sky filled with stars where you feel so small, right? And he writes this. He says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars that you have set in place, That's wonder. When I consider that, my mind is blown. What, what, I I ask this question, what, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would care for him? In other words, when I think about all that, I think, who am, who am, who am I? Who am I that I'm on your radar, that the king of kings, that the creator of it all, Powerful enough to do all of this, these galaxies that are whirling around by the the, the sound of your voice, the work of your hands, and yet I am on your radar today? Come on. That's crazy. That's wonder. He says, you made him, you made humans a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you crowned us with glory and honor. And I'm not saying we ought to walk around going, God is massively in love with me. In a way that it just fuels us being the star of our own show. You know, that's what the kids say these days. It's like, hey, you're playing front and center. You need to play the background a little bit, right? Like you're making this all about you. You're kind of playing the lead role in everything, which we're all tempted to do. So I'm not saying to live our life that way, but I am saying it's okay to be aware of the fact that God knows you. That God knows how many hairs are on your head. God knows your dreams and your hopes and your cares and your worries and your concerns. You are on the radar of the Almighty today. That should cause joy and gratitude and comfort and peace that he's got the whole world in his hand. And if the birds aren't worried about how they're going to get their next meal, 
Why do humans think that we can add an hour to our day by worrying, Jesus asked. So snap into the reality by counting your blessings, by growing in your wonder of, I can't believe it. If you would do that for me, what else could you do? That's what wonder does. Wonder opens our heart to faith and it fuels our joy and our gratitude. And wonder inspires us ultimately. It inspires us to humility and it inspires us to learn, right? I mean, you remember when you were a kid and you wondered about things and then you went and learned about things. You realized how small you were, but you became obsessed with it and interested in it and curious about it. And our curiosity these days, we've killed our curiosity. But instead of being curious about the kind of offense that the Texans run, which I think we should all try to figure that out because it is unbelievable what's happening with the Houston Texans. But instead of being consumed with the sales that are coming up, this Christmas, or instead of being consumed with what the influencers are doing to get themselves ready in the morning, like instead of being consumed with the next trend and the next thing, let's get consumed with the only one that really matters. Let's get consumed with Jesus. Do you know he's the only one, he is the only one that is able to to hold up under the scrutiny of curiosity He's the only one that's big enough for you to be able to study and understand and learn more about, yet never get to the end. Let's get consumed with him that the almighty God crammed all the power of himself into a human to come and be with us. Let's get consumed with that. Let's get consumed with him, I, I, I want to um, end with this, uh, um, an illustration about Shrek. And I know a lot of you probably saw it coming. You were like, he's probably going to do Shrek right here. <laughs> this is random. But I was watching this with my kids the other day. It was just like on TV. And I was like, yeah, you know, we stopped and watched it some. And y- you know the plot of Shrek? The plot of Shrek is so typical. The plot of Shrek is the plot of life. The the, the plot of Shrek is the plot of what movie writers would come up with. And it is so different than the plot of Jesus. The plot of Shrek is there's this king and he's in love with this girl, but the girl's gotten captured by a dragon. And instead of going and getting the girl, he puts on a competition to find somebody else to go do his bidding to find someone else to go do his dirty work. He's like, I'm not gonna go after this dragon, but I'm gonna find some brave person, we're gonna put an award out there, and we're gonna find this person who's gonna willingly go through this adventure to go find this girl, and that is Shrek, right? But you know, in the story of God, though, that's not the way it works. When you were lost, when you were in captivity, God became flesh to come and get you. He didn't send somebody else. Oh, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, all in one said, I'll go. I will go. I will go to rescue you. That's how much he loves you. He came after you. Not to pay you back for something, not to punish you for something, but to win you back. And maybe you've never put your faith in him, and maybe that's a, maybe that's something for today. Maybe today you'd go, I I, I need to put my faith in Jesus today. Maybe for some of you, you need to come back to him today. Maybe for some of you, you need to allow God to reinvigorate you with that wide-eyed, mystified wonder that the king of kings came down that God came low, that the Almighty became small, that God became flesh, that Emmanuel, God with us, is here. Father, I pray that that would be what every one of us walk away with today, that we would not be in awe of music, that we would not be in awe of any kind of sermon, that we would not be in awe of a church, but we would be in awe of Jesus. That we'd want to know more that we want to get to know you better, that our minds would be blown. Who are we that you would be thinking of us? Who are we that we are on your radar today? 
Father, that is what you can do this Christmas season. And so we invite you to do that. Help us to get lost in wonder. We love you. We're grateful for you. We cannot thank you enough for Jesus. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen.